Welcome everyone to another of our continuing studies in the book of Psalms. Today we're going to be contemplating part two of Psalm two. Before we enter the word of God, it's always wise to lay down a foundation of prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate our study today. So please join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you have brought about to bring us here today. We recognize that there is no such thing as coincidence. And Lord, that you knew that each one of us that would be listening today would be listening. And so, Father, as we come before you, we ask that you would clear our minds and hearts of the things that occupy it, that we would be able to spend this next hour plus with you and in the privacy of our time with the Holy Spirit, that we might be able to understand what you have here for us today, that you would use his holy power to light our way, to illuminate these uh, words for us that we could better understand, apply it, and uh, live using this message that you have for us here today in Psalm 2. We just ask these things in the precious and powerful name of your Son, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as you can see by the questions on the screen, there are quite a few interesting topics that we're going to delve into, but I thought I would start by reviewing briefly what we covered in part one. And we looked at the first six verses of Psalm 2, and just to remind everyone, these verses read beginning at verse 1, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So as we took a look at this in part one, a couple of conclusions we were able to reach. First of all, Psalm 2 appears to be a trialogue which takes place in heaven between three individuals in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Verses 1 to 5 are being spoken by God the Holy Spirit to God the Father and God the Son, on the commentary on the state of man. And it's interesting that perhaps 3,000 years have passed since these words have been written, and yet this commentary is is applicable today and at this very moment as it was when it was written about 3,000 years ago. Verse 6, by the way, are God the Father's declaration of what he has determined as his plan to redeem mankind from this state of rage and anger that it finds itself in. According to Peter, John, and the other apostles in Acts 4, Psalm 2 was actually penned by David a millennia before the crucifixion. And you can read about that in Acts 4 and see that this particular psalm, with the exact same words as you see here in verse 2, appearing in Acts 4 and attributed to David, the king. Now, it discusses as a topic, discusses the utter foolishness of the redeemed or unredeemed and rebellious of mankind who seem to be in this condition of perpetual rage against the God who created them. And it also reveals what God the Father's plan is to deal with the rebels and the ragers. And so as we look at this, We need to understand that the unnamed driver behind this rebellion is the original rebel himself, Satan, and this war against God began before God created the earth and man. It's been ongoing, and the world was created after this war had already begun. And so we realize that the that how long into eternity before God laid down the foundations of the world and introduced a concept called time and started time moving forward, how long that this battle existed, we do not know. We know that Satan was a created being, and he decided to rebel against God and wanted to make himself God. Now, Psalm 2 will answer many of the questions that you and I have today as to why man is in this constant state of rage and war. If you've noticed, Whatever your life experience is to date, 
man has constantly been in a state of war in a state of conflict in a state of discontent and turbulence. And so this particular psalm very much addresses this particular topic. So let's start with our new text for this session, and we'll begin at verse 7 in Psalm 2. And the psalm continues, I will declare the decree. The Lord has saith unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So who is speaking in this passage, and to whom are these verses being spoken? And we want to start with verse 7 here. I will declare the decree. The Lord had said to me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So God the Son is speaking and stating here what God the Holy Spirit uh, has, uh, God the Holy Spirit, um, exactly what God the Father declared to him. Anyone who is reading these words is witnessing the, this conversation between the Trinity. And so the Son is speaking, saying, God the Father said to me, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. That's the gist of what's being declared here. And so as the son is, is telling this to the other members of the Trinity, he's also telling it to anyone who is reading it or hearing it. The conversation is taking place in heaven, and heaven is outside the time domain. In heaven, there is no time as you and I know it. Yet the language here does contain references to time, meaning that this action is taking place in the time domain on earth. But in heaven, God is above or outside time. And so it's not as if God has a lot of time. God is outside time. So all times are apparent and obvious to all three members of the Trinity at every single time. It's only when you go into uh, this construct called earth where the time domain exists. And of course, it exists in interstellar space as well. So heaven, this third heaven where God's domain is, God is resident in this area, is outside the time domain entirely. Now, the father knew that before the foundations of earth were laid, that his son would be he who would redeem mankind. He knew, he wasn't surprised when Satan rebelled in heaven and had to be tossed out of heaven and was tossed to the earth. And he's not surprised at this, nor is he surprised that mankind would need a savior. That was part of his plan because he knew it all along because he is he, he is God who was before there was and shall continue until after there isn't. And so when you think about the time domain, it is a, a physical dimension in which mankind lives. But again, heaven is outside that, this heaven domain area, um, more technically the third heaven, the first heaven being Earth's atmosphere, the second heaven, heaven being interstellar space. The third heaven, which incidentally the Apostle Paul claims to have been caught up into and witnessed some things there that he tells us about in his particular epistles, this third heaven is not subject to time. Now, in verse 7, there are two words to note. One word the translators added, one word they did not translate. And so we can see, based on what you can see on the screen, that art was added, that 9999. Nine, the number represents a Strong's index of numbers uh, that are applied to individual words, and that was added. There's no Hebrew character for it. There is a Hebrew character which is translated. Um, we, we have the translation of it. It wasn't translated in this particular verse. This word is the word ele. It's a broad term that means either for or as for or towards, which could be a position in time or a position in order, or, or the word at. Now, the word begotten there in this, this verse, I will declare the uh, decree, the Lord has said unto me, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That word begotten 
is the word yalad, which means to bring forth in birth. It is revealing or indicative of a human birth, which I believe makes this particular event refer to the human incarnation of Jesus Christ. He was God's only begotten son, his only son that was brought into earth through human birth. And that human birthing of his son was how he came into become that individual that walked the shores of, of Galilee back many, many years ago. Now, the word day, and it says here that this day have I begotten thee, it, the word yom, it is a day, specific 24-hour time period, or a time period. And in this particular usage of this word yom, it refers to a particular time period and not a particular day. It wasn't the specific day that Mary gave birth to uh, Jesus in the manger, but rather a particular time period, and you'll see why as we progress. I see this as the father telling the son that the timing of his birth is linked to him being mankind's savior, and the timing of his installation as king of kings is going to be linked to the removal of the ragers and the rebels. He was born a human child, but he is going to receive, according to verse 8, ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Um, this refers to him now having that as another day or time period. Uh, that, that is going to apply to Scripture. And again, we'll get into the timing of this and exactly what happens. But for now, understand that verse 7 is referring to, I believe, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And just a note, um, I'm going to share a lot of what I have come to understand these Scriptures to mean, but you should do your own homework and be a Berean like Paul exhorted those to be like the Bereans who were more noble than those at Thessalonica in that they received the word of God with joy and gladness, but then they went back and searched the scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was true. And I suggest the same thing here. You should come to your own conclusions after you study this. I'd like to introduce some of these thoughts to you, but please, just because I'm giving the message today doesn't mean that you should take what I am saying as absolute truth. The only absolute truth is the word of God, and I will do my best to try to interpret that. Now, we hear, uh, we hear this term that uh, Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm. What's a messianic psalm? A messianic psalm is a psalm where the words in the psalm refer to Jesus Christ, Messiah, and are quoted in the New Testament. We find that here. And so the Apostle Paul is, is going to uh, be one of the people that will quote, and another place that is being quoted uh, will be the Apostles uh, Peter and John. So here is Paul, and this uh, particular quote in Acts 13 reads, and we declare unto you glad tidings. He's addressing this particular group, how that the promise was made unto the fathers that God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second Psalm, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Those, those words are highlighted because they're the direct quote from Psalm 2. And as concerning that, he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. And uh, Acts 13 continues. So, how does Paul's quote of this verse help us to understand what Psalm 2-7 is actually saying? Well, first of all, the event took place in a town called Antioch, and it was during Paul's first missionary journey in approximately AD 46. Now, Jesus was likely crucified about AD 32. Um, so this was uh, 14 years, perhaps, after Jesus Christ was crucified buried, resurrected, and ascended. And Paul, at that point in time, former persecutor of the church, now turned apostle after uh, Jesus Christ spoke to him on the road to Damascus. We know that particular story. He then went on to go on to a number of missionary journeys, and this would have been his first missionary journey. Paul attributes 
Psalm 2 is a promise made to the fathers, which would have included David as a member of that promise. And we saw that uh, back in the first part of Psalm 2 that David specifically was the one that penned this particular psalm. So that's why I've included him here as one of the fathers, because clearly he was someone that would have been given this information, this promise. And the promise was that Jesus would be resurrected as mankind's savior and declares that the fulfillment of this promise was being witnessed by those who came to faith in about AD 46. And so he's pegging this, this event of being resurrected this day, I have begotten thee, um, and concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now more no, now no more to return to corruption, talks about the fact that Jesus Christ was resurrected to eternal life as the first of first fruits who would receive this particular treatment. Now, the promise is still being fulfilled today, and it's going to continue to be the only basis by which any person can be saved. They must come to God through Jesus Christ, and that is part of the, the uh, process here that you cannot be saved. There's no other word by which we can be saved. There's no other name by which we can be saved, and that's the name of Jesus Christ. And so it's that name, and it's through the substitutionary death that Jesus Christ made and gave his life for on the cross that has brought you and I to the point where we too could partake of this particular promise, and this promise that was declared to David and others. Now, this is also true, by the way, and these conditions exist not only back in AD 46 and every single moment in time since AD 46 to the present, but will also exist during Daniel's 70th week, this oncoming seven-year time period of great, great tribulation upon the planet, and also afterwards during the millennium, and all the way up through the Great Rebellion, which will precede the Great White Throne Judgment. So this condition of Jesus Christ being mankind's Savior was given as a promise way back a thousand years before his incarnation on the planet. And by the way, it's the same Jesus that the belief of those who were Old Testament saints, they believed on God's provision. Not everything had been fully revealed to them at that point in time, but to the extent that they believed God, as we know, for Abraham, for example, believing God was accounted to him as righteousness. And so we see Paul give us a little bit more information in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 to 24, when he declares, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the fr first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. That's a euphemism for died. And that's what, what uh, he meant and what he said. Verse 21, for since by man came death, that's a small case man, by capital case man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, that's the small case man, all die. Even so in Christ, that's the large case M, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are, at, are Christ at his coming, his return, his second coming. Then, this is a, a, a word that has to do with setting something in order in time. So after Christ comes, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. And so as Paul was writing this in the uh, first century AD, and writing this letter to the Corinthians and trying to help them to understand the order of, of world events that were going to occur, the fact is that to, to him, he's looking at this and saying, well, this coming, this second coming of Jesus Christ, and if I'm looking out beyond that, there's something when Jesus Christ delivers the kingdom to God the Father and puts an end to all rule, authority, and power. Well, we would take that to be the great white throne judgment when Jesus Christ hands everything to God the Father. And so that is at least 1,007 years of a time period that we see 
because seven years of Daniel's 70th week, a thousand years of a millennium. And so all these events are in the future of Paul as he's sharing this word. So we just need to get ourselves straight in terms of where this occurred, when it occurred, and what time period it's it's speaking of. Let's get back to Psalm 2. So we looked at, at uh, verse 7. Let's take a look at verse 8. And the question here is, what is the Father instructing the Son to do in verse 8? And what are the implications of this? Verse 8 says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Again, this is uh, Jesus giving the quote that his father had given him. He's telling what the father said to him. And so the father said, ask of me, and I, the father, shall give you, the son, the heathen for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. So God, st the son is still speaking. As I said, it's what God the Father had declared to him, he's simply relating that. In verse 7, Jesus Christ was named Savior to mankind in his role as the only begotten Son. In verse 8, Jesus Christ is being named heir to all of God the Father's creation. And that's seen in all the peoples, the word heathen meaning nations, and all the earth in its entirety, the uttermost parts of the earth. And so, we see this, this twofold declaration that Jesus was going to be the savior of mankind, and he is also heir to all of the Father's creation. Now notice, and you can't help noticing this, the interaction between the members of the Godhead. It's interesting that God the Father doesn't force or command God the Son to take on the role of heir. He, he instructs the Son in verse 8, ask of me, ask, sha'al to inquire or request. There's a there's a, a, a respect and a courtesy shown by each member of the Godhead to each other. Even though they are uh, co-equals, even though they are coexistent within the Trinity, every member of the Trinity by free will submits to the others. What, what a great model for us as human beings. Much of the rage that goes on on planet Earth could be eliminated if humans just practiced this very godly submission of one to another in humility. Now, Jesus rejected, if you recall, Matthew 4, 8 to 9, he rejected a shortcut offered by Satan. And in Matthew 8, uh, 4, 8, 9, it says, again, the devil took him up, meaning Jesus Christ took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Satan wanted Jesus Christ to worship him because that would then mean that, that uh, Jesus Christ would be inferior to Satan. And of course, that's a, a ludicrous proposition. And how does Jesus deal with it? He simply quotes him the word of God and uh, sort of settles the matter. But um, notice that uh, Jesus does not argue and say, well, you can't do that because you don't have the kingdoms of the world to offer me. He instead defeats him on the basis of scripture. So it's clear that Satan actually had the kingdoms of the world, which is what we understand why he is the prince of this world. He is the prince of the power of the air. He is the one who ultimately has significant control in his tenancy, and he is a tenant landlord, if you will, or a tenant occupant of this particular planet, subject to the landlord God the Father. We know that from studying Daniel's 70th week that Satan's tenant ruler status of earth will be terminated at the end of those seven years. And so if you're Satan and you're realizing that this era is coming to a close, no wonder you're more and more frantic to have humankind adopt your program so that you can be put in to become God and to replace God. And so his time is drawing short and he's getting more and more desperate. Hence, we see the intensity of the anger and the rage and the warfare in this world continuing to escalate. So let's take a look at verse 9 that says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. 
when and why is Jesus going to rule them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like pottery? That's the question. When does that occur? And so verse 9 is still part of what God the Father told Jesus, sets forth a condition of Jesus' rule during the millennium. Once Jesus ascends to the throne as King of kings and Lord of lords and rules, these are going to be conditions. And you shall break them, God the Father saying to Jesus, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Israel is back on the clock as God's nation through which Jesus Christ will rule the, the planet. Temple sacrifices are going to be reinstituted during the millennium, not because Jesus Christ's finished work is unfinished. It is, in fact, finished, but it's the fact that that the work that he accomplished on the cross, there still has to be shedding of blood. And this will stand as an object lesson to everyone, every human being that goes into the millennium and those who are born into the millennium, that they too will need to make a personal decision individually to accept or reject Jesus Christ's payment for their sin. That's the whole process there, why temple sacrifices are reinstituted, even though the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is ruling from Jerusalem. We know that Satan will also be bound in the bottomless pit during that 1,000-year millennium. Now, it doesn't explicitly say that his armies will be, but if the commander-in-chief of those armies is now bound, it may be logical to believe that the minions, those who are under the direct control of Satan, are also likewise bound. But I can't, I can't find anything that gives us a definitive answer. Of course, as um, Dr. Chuck Missler once uh, glibly suggested, don't worry if you don't understand it now, we'll explain on the way up. So, um, you know, we don't know. Now, mortal man who enters the millennium will still have Adam's sin nature. So there will have to be, and that's, by the way, the spirit of rebellion, the whole thing that Psalm 2 is talking about. And so that rebellion will take place, but not overtly. And it's not going to take place overtly because of what verse 9 says. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them, dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel indicates that Jesus is not going to tolerate any outward rebellion. Now, what goes on in the human heart, it's very clear that after Satan is loosed after the millennium, he's very quickly able to unite a rebellion against God once again. But while Jesus Christ is ruling for that thousand year time period, they're not going to be able to, to rebel and get away with it. Outward compliance is forced by the threat of swift punishment, which is rule them with a rod of iron, dash them in pieces like pottery. And so that's why this, this verse tells us a little bit about the conditions of the millennium, that it will be harsh in the sense of those that try to thwart God and thwart God's plan. Today, People do that all the time, and they're not dashed to pieces uh, like pottery and, and, and ruled with a rod of iron. So the point that we, we need to take is not so much that he's dealing with the offenders as much as Jesus Christ himself is going to be protecting the freedom of the godly, who most of the people there, at least those coming into the millennium, want to live under Jesus Christ's sovereignty. There won't be any persecution of Christians and Bible-believing Jews. There won't be that in the millennium. In fact, the millennium is designed as the thousand-year rest promised to the nation of Israel. <clears throat> it's going to be very Jewish. And so those that want to, to observe uh, their religion and worship the Lord in the way that the Lord has instructed them to do so, now can meet and worship without any fear of persecution whatsoever. Rebellion by nature always starts in the heart of man. And as long as it doesn't express itself in outward rebellion, Jesus is not going to act with the individual rebel. As long as there is conformity, outward conformity, but it's when People try to incite others that he is going to act very, very swiftly.
Now, as we know from Scripture, following the millennium, Satan is loosed, and he leads those of mankind who want to follow him into a final rebellion, which, of course, is crushed by God, leading to something that you and I know as the great white throne judgment when the construct of time, uh, the construct of death, the construct of Hades or Sheol or hell, all are destroyed and dealt with once and for all and done with before God remakes the heavens and earth and has those who um, have accepted his payment for their sin to become permanent residents with him in immortality in all eternity going forward. Now, let's just take a peek of some of this from the book of Revelation. And I'm going to be going into chapter 19 and a little bit of 20 here, but let's get a background. So in uh, uh, prior to uh, chapter 19, uh, beginning with uh, the sixth chapter on up to the 19th chapter, there have been a whole series of judgments that have been poured onto the planet, a total of 21 judgments that have rained down on the planet in a seven-year time period that is going to see the death of um, literally uh, billions of people. And so at the very end of it, when things are just about done, and scripture says that had these days continued even longer, there would be no mankind left on the planet. So there are some left. And the vision here in verse 11, where John the Apostle is writing, and he says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him, the white horse, was called faithful and true. In righteousness he judges and makes war. So we see the, the role of Jesus now as the righteous judge, that he is now being uh, sent back to the planet to make war on those who are usurpers. Now the description of him, his eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew but himself. He was clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine lemon, linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now, those armies, we're told earlier in chapter 19, are the redeemed saints, the, the, those saints who were redeemed and resurrected. And so they're, cl they're clothed in fine lim linen, meaning white and clean. It's, the, it's, a, it's an outward sign of purity and righteousness. Verse 15 says, now out of his mouth, Jesus' mouth, goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And if we realize that the book of Revelation is a whole series of signs and models, then this should make a very clear sense. It's this double-edged sword that is also known as the word of God. And it goes out of his mouth. He says something, and he'll strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Sound familiar from Psalm 2, ruling with a rod of iron? He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness, fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, in the sunlight, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, this is that first heaven, that's the atmosphere, come and gather together for the supper of the great God. This is not the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the supper of the great God. And now you can see what is being served. That you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, the flesh of all people, free and slave, both great and small. These are the people who refused, by the way, to accept Jesus Christ while they were still alive. And these are the usurpers that are being removed from the planet in preparation for Jesus Christ to return and set up his millennial kingdom. And this particular story continues in verse 19, and I saw the beast. This is Antichrist, uh, the one who has is embodied by Satan, who is now 
whipping up to a frenzy and whipping the armies of earth into a frenzy to try to rebel against God, something very silly to try because it's not going to be done. It's not going to be successful. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. So if there was any clarity or any clarity that we needed here as to why the nations are raging and why they are trying to make war against Christ we see here that Revelation kind of gives us the answer. The beast, Antichrist, was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked the signs and it worked signs rather in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two, Antichrist and the false prophet, were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. This is Gehenna hell. They're the first two residents of Gehenna hell are the beast, this is Antichrist, and the false prophet who assisted Antichrist in deceiving the nations. And it says here, and the rest were killed, these are all the rebels and ragers, were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So you, this is the final Armageddon, if you will. It's not this big battle, it's a pretty quick thing. Jesus Christ says the word, and boom, they're done. They are, they are now carcasses laying there, and those who have persisted in that rebellion will now be ushered into, um, when they are resurrected at the great white throne judgment, they will be ushered into their final resting place, which is Gehenna hell, the lake of fire. Continuing on in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. If there's any doubt about who he is, this is it. It's, the, it's Satan. And bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years, that millennial time period were finished. But after those these things, he must be released for a little while. This is why he's released from the bottomless pit. He leads the final rebellion of mankind, and they go down and defeat as God defeats them. And then comes the great white throne judgment, where all are judged. The quick and the dead, the living and the, the dead are all judged at that event. So I wanted to give you this background so you could see where Psalm 2 fit into the whole narrative. Let's go back to the next passage, verses 10 through 12 of Psalm 2, and some great instructions here. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. These are the kings that are rebelling against God and against his anointed, O be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him, meaning the sun. So, who is speaking these verses? To whom are these verses being spoken? This beginning with the be wise now. Well, first of all, God the Holy Spirit is now speaking to the nations, peoples, the rebellers, the, re the rebels, the ragers, and to everyone who has not yet made their choice, advising each to carefully consider and apply what God has revealed so far in Psalm 2. He's laid out his plans in the first nine verses and let everybody have a peek into what is going to happen in the time domain and how long that is going to happen for until he returns. And of course, we know that it's been about 2,000 years since he exited the planet and counting, and he still has not returned. And so we've not seen that, that seven-year time period called the tribulation time period, or better and more accurately stated, Daniel's 70th week. So all should be considering and thinking about what are the consequences? I need to make my choices. And there's no one that promised anyone tomorrow. No one promises you tomorrow. You could be dead. You could encounter an accident that's totally unforeseen. And all of a sudden, you are now no, no more alive. Well, 
you're now beyond the point in time where you can make a choice. So all of this, all of this message of Psalm 2 is an evangelical message advising people to make their choice and do so. And now let's look at how this message is revealed. We need to get a little bit of a vocabulary lesson in some of these words. Now, resistance will not work because ultimately everyone will bow to God's will and acknowledge Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So accepting God's offer or rejecting it is a choice with eternal consequences. And that's the point that the psalmist David is making in Psalm 2. There is a choice coming. This choice is going to have eternal consequences for every single human that has ever been or ever shall be. And it, these eternal consequences, once your eternity is decided, it is decided there is no more do-over or mulligan or anything like that. It is what it is based on what you've chosen. And as I said, no one has guaranteed you that you have any time beyond right this moment in the rest of your mortal life. Something could happen. And Odds are that if enough people listen to this message and enough people read this, certainly it has happened where someone thought they had all the time in the world and then, oops, it's too late and you have no do-over. So it says in verse 10, be wise, therefore. The word wise, I've given you the way that it's stated in the Hebrew and the root word in parentheses, the word sakal, means to consider or think it through or make a smart decision. Be wise. This is a choice now that God the Son is saying to all of humankind, those who are rebelling, and saying, look, think this through for a minute. Stop being so quick to follow what Satan has told you. He's a liar from the beginning. He's always going to lie. He's always going to tell you something that is not true. So make sure you stop and consider very carefully what your consequences are because you're about to make a choice. And making no choice is a choice because you get to choose the smoking section. You see, you and I get to choose between smoking and non-smoking sections. The non-smoking section is going to be wonderful. I hasn't conceived, ear is, uh, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, mind has not conceived how much glory is placed that this, this will be that God has in mind for you and for me when we make that decision to accept the payment of Jesus Christ and the payment for our sin that is put upon him as a substitutionary death. So we are to be wise. We're to think it through and make a choice. And now we're also to be instructed. And the word yasar means to be corrected or chastened or, re or reformed. In other words, we are told to think about it and be corrected because for the most part, the words that we are hearing from planet Earth are all words that are part of this rebellion language that we see going on around us. And so we need to be corrected from a wrong view that we have. It says in verse 11, serve the Lord with fear. How do we serve him? The word is abad. In Hebrew, it means to voluntarily work as a bond servant bound to God. A bond servant is a very interesting term. A bond servant is one when you uh, became a servant or a a slave to a master, you did so because you had incurred a debt that you could not pay. And so you hired yourself out for a period of seven years to the master. And so once you had paid your debt to the master, then you would be set free. But there was a group of people who were servants who basically said, my master loves me and I love him and I love, I want to continue to be part of his family. And so I will voluntarily take on the role as bond servant. And that is where the, um, the servant would then go to the doorpost of the house and have an awl, A-W-L, stuck through his ear into which an earring would be placed. And his blood on the doorpost would signify his belonging to that house. That's how he became a bond servant. And so this was a very common practice in the day in which uh, Psalm 2 was written. 
and uh, continues to this day to have this connotation of being one who binds themselves voluntarily to God. Now, it says that serve the Lord with fear. Well, what's fear? The word fear, yara, means a complete and deep reverence and awe for God. In other words, we love him. We want to be part of his family forever, but we also fear him with reverence, not with frightened because I watched a bad movie, but rather I have this deep, deep reverence for God, and it's balanced with the deep, deep love for God. That's the picture that's being put here. And rejoice with trembling. It's to rejoice with trembling. Well, what's all that about? So the rejoice means extreme joy. And the extreme joy comes because you realize that the creator of the universe wants to have a personal relationship with you. That's what he's after. That's what he's always been after. And if you've been resisting him and you're hearing these words today, that's all he wants. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to have you occupy a special place in the creation that he's made so that you can be enjoying it in fellowship with him and with every other one of his creatures who has been saved and redeemed. That's what he's looking for. And it says that we are to, to serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling. The word trembling, ra'ad, the root word is to shudder. And we'd be shuddering thinking of what the future will be if we choose to reject him or delay in choosing, and then something happens and it's too late for us. So this instruction is very, very critical that is being made here in verses 10 and 11. And so as we look at this, it's, it's an incredible offer that we have. We have an offer of eternal life from the creator of the universe who says, hey, I'll pay your price of admission because you can't pay it. And I'll not only pay it, I want to welcome you there. I encourage you there. I will go to great lengths to make sure you accept this invitation to become a new creation in God, in Christ. And so this is what the great Christian exchange is. We exchange with Jesus Christ. He takes our sins. We take his eternal life. He takes the punishment that we're due on himself, and we get to be righteous because he was righteous. It's the great exchange. And this is the the crux of Psalm 2, trying to get this raging world to stop for a second and understand that there is a choice with eternal consequences, and there's one wonderfully good choice and one horribly bad choice, and the choice is to the individual. So what's actually happening here in verses 10 and 12 have to do, and I'm representing this on a diagram, and so the diagram represents the basis for a complete personal relationship with the creator of the universe and his instructions for a joyful and productive life here on earth before we die and then go into the grave and either resurrect it out or raptured alive if we're that generation. And so follow the diagram on your screen. The first thing is that he speaks about in verse 10 is be wise, therefore, well, wise and wisdom, that's a, a mental thing. And to be instructed, that's a mental thing. And so this occupies our mind. We're to serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. This is our heart. We're to serve him with an undivided heart. We serve out of the heart. We serve and we have awe for our heavenly father and love for our heavenly father that comes out of our heart, the seat of our innermost being, our seat of, of what we believe and cling on to the most. And finally, in verse 12, we're to kiss the son and be, be reconciled. The whole idea here is this reconciliation comes through Jesus Christ. We are to be we are to kiss him and be reconciled. I'm going to talk about that in some detail. But the point is this, this diagram is really verses 10, 11, and 12. And so when we look at this, this diagram is very, very reminiscent of something called the Shema of the Old Testament. And if you ask any, any Orthodox Jew or any practicing Jew today what the Shema is, they will recite this word 
for you. Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 7. Hear, O Israel. The word hear, by the way, is the word Shema. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. And these words which I command to you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And it goes on to talk about the fact that you're to put them on your doorpost. That's why in Jewish homes these that, that follow uh, Judaism, you will oftentimes find a little decorative metal box that is set at a 45 degree angle on one of the doorposts, and inside it will contain this particular piece of scripture. And it is marking this house as a house belonging to someone who is a Jewish believer in Jehovah God, the God who makes and keeps his promises. But you know, Jesus Christ also commented on this. This is not just an Old Testament thing that we have this, this mind and heart and will serve God with all your mind and all your heart and all your soul and all your, this, all of this is all part of what God said to us. And Jesus Christ said this, when he was asked to explain the Shema in Matthew 22, 36 to, to 38, he was asked, uh, by one person, teacher, what's the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And this is at the heart of what the relationship is between God and his people. It is having that heart and mind and will, all of our love that we are to serve God with. And so as we see this, this relationship is begun with each believer in his or her mortal state. It's continued on into eternity once that believer is resurrected or raptured into his or her eternal state. That's, that's what the Lord is talking about here in Psalm 2. But there's a little bit more. And we see here this passage. We're going to look at verse 12 because verse 12 has confounded people. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Well, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. This blessing is a beatitude. It is a blessing. Blessed are those who. Blessed are all they that put their trust in the son. Not in the father, not in the Holy Spirit, but in the son. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way. I am the way. One way. I am the way. And so, blessed, all those who put their trust in Jesus Christ do become happy, joyful because of this choice. So, let's take a look at this verse 12 because there's a couple of things going on there that we don't want to miss. First of all, you see this expression, kiss the sun. What is he talking about? How do you kiss a resurrected Savior who's sitting in heaven where you aren't right now? How do you do that? Well, this is an Orientalism. An Orientalism is an Easternism because the book, the Bible, is an Eastern book written to an Eastern people. It's an Oriental book, if you will. And it refers to the anointing of kings with oil. And with that anointing, there is a holy kiss given to the new king as an act of homage. And you can take a look at 1 Samuel 10, 1 with the anointing of the first king of Israel, Saul, by the prophet Samuel. And it talks about anointing David as king and anointing others as king. And this is what's involved. It's the pouring of oil. Oil always represents the presence of the Holy Spirit and a holy kiss. And so this issue of kiss the son is you are paying homage to the son. You are pledging to the son. You are recognizing the son is your king. Now, verses 10 and 11 are instructions from the Holy Spirit for the ragers and rebels to repent and now place themselves under the kingship of God the Son. That would be an, an appropriate first act of obedience to kiss the Son. You are saying, okay, I'm done with my rebellion. I will follow you. I am pledging myself to you. And so that is 
the whole reason why kiss the sun is there. Well, now we have this next phrase, uh, kissing the sun, by the way, complete reconciliation and obedience to serve. The question is, have you made your savior also your king of kings? This is a personal choice that each one of us makes. Do we make our savior, Jesus Christ, is he your king of kings? He needs to be both. If we're to grow in maturity as a Christian, it's because we have made him our king of kings. And as a result, we enjoy a closer personal fellowship, a closer instruction under the agency of the Holy Spirit through the word of God. Now, the word son comes from the Aramaic. It has several translations. The one that is most appropriate for this is the heir, the heir to the throne. But it's also called beloved. It's also pure. And all of these words would apply to Jesus Christ. He is the son. He's the beloved son. He is the only begotten son whom the Lord loves, the father loves. He's also pure. He never sinned. He's fully righteous. The only time that he was ever associated with sin is by taking your sin and my sin upon himself as part of that substitution on the cross. So kiss the bar, kiss the son. Jerome, by the way, connects this title with the need for pure worship, which seems to be connected to the story in John where Jesus tells the, the woman at the well that the time is approaching where true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And this is what people uh, would take from this particular point where you're worshiping the Son. All of this comes from that thought of kissing the Son and paying homage to the Father in spirit and in truth. So we've covered kiss the sun, but let's continue. The next phrase here is lest he be angry. So what is that all about? Well, lest he be angry implies some consequences for not making him your king or salvation. This is really what it is. And as part of salvation, there's a couple of things we need to understand. What angers God the most? What, what drives God makes him very, very angry. Well, one candidate for this we find in Romans 1, where it says that, that those in Romans 1, and pick it up about midway through the chapter, and it talks about those who worship the creation instead of the creator. They were not thankful to God for doing what he did. They instead said, oh, this is neat. Let me go worship this rock. I'm going to make this rock my God. This is, this is now my God. I'm going to worship this rock. Failing to worship Jesus Christ, failing to acknowledging God as the creator. That carries some pretty stiff consequences for those who refuse to acknowledge him as a creator. Another, by the way, thing that angered him is when the national leaders of Israel rejected Jesus Christ as king. We have that on that very first Palm Sunday where Jesus Christ filled about a dozen or two dozen prophecies of his first coming in that story of him sitting on the back of a colt of a donkey, riding up over the hill into uh, uh, over the Mount of Olives specifically, where he would then see across the Kidron Valley, see the city of Jerusalem. And as we know, the Pharisees basically told all of Jesus's followers to shut up and not declare him king. And um, he then, they then said to Jesus, tell your people to shut up. And he said, hey, if they shut up, even these stones will be crying out that I am who I say I am. And so those leaders, by the way, they were the religious leaders and to them was entrusted the government of Israel. So when they made a decision, they made a decision for Israel corporately I mean, we get that today with the U.S. government, where people in Congress make a decision which we may or may not agree with, but it's the law of the land. And so here, corporately, that group rejected Jesus Christ. And so what does he do? He weeps over the city of Jerusalem and says, if you would only know this day, what this day, the salvation that this day would bring. But guess what? You Now you're blind in part until, until you petition me to return. And there's a whole bunch of things that we could talk about, but that's a different study. 
Then we have this term, so kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish from the way. Well, what's that all about? Perishing from the way means the perish there is to abode, to wander away to destruction with no hope of, dis of escape. It is a permanent state of punishment and, and judgment. Again, there's a consequence here for a bad choice. And to perish in the way, God the Son is instructing us in this passage that there are two ways. The word way is the Hebrew word derek, a path or a course of life. One leads to reconciliation with God. The other leads to death and destruction. Proverbs 14, 12, and 16, 25 are identical. They say there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. It seems like it's a good path to go on. Look, all the ragers and rebels, why are they raging against God? Why are they trying to cast off his institutions like marriage and creation and all of this? Why are they so outraged? It's because there is this way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. They're raging because they don't have any peace. You can't know peace unless you know Jesus Christ. And so this is really what is being talked about here. This is the reconciliation. God doesn't want you to be consigning yourself to an eternity of punishment. He doesn't want that. He sent his only begotten son to die for you that you would not have to suffer that fate. Psalm 2 clearly defines the choices of, that confront humankind. Choose the king of kings or prepare yourself to suffer the consequence. And the consequences will be for all ragers and rebels that they will perish from the way. Their life will be cut short and they will perish. Even if they live to an old age and they die in their sins, not having accepted Jesus Christ as their savior, they will pay for that choice in eternity. This is a matter of choice. And we continue. Now let's take a look at the next phrase. When his wrath is kindled but a little. Well, what does that mean? This, this choice exists to choose one's path prior to him pouring out his great wrath upon the planet and the rebels and ragers. He tells us about that. The book of Revelation, chapters 6 through 19, are all about the judgments that are being poured out on the planet upon those that are rebelling. And so we see in Revelation 16, 1, and this is John describing what he heard, then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the seven bowls of wrath of God onto the earth. That is what is being commanded. And these are the final seven judgments that are horrific in which most of mankind die. It is catastrophic death on a scale never, ever witnessed before in magnitude and scope ever since the great flood. And this is a horrible series of judgment. And by the way, in response to the judgment, many say, who's going to hide us from the lamb, but nobody repents. They choose, they choose to die and have eternal punishment. That's what's so mind boggling. Read the book of Revelation. You'll encounter that three times that people refuse to repent, but know who is sending the judgment. Jesus Christ, and why he's sending the judgment but refused to do anything about it. Daniel's 70th week does feature God's great wrath. The millennium, where King Jesus will act quickly against all rebels, seems like a little wrath. But putting down the rebellion at the end of the millennium is another time of great wrath that leads directly to the great white throne judgment. So I see this as his wrath is kindled but a little as instruction to those who are in the millennium to stop and repent and make sure that they, even though God has created a wonderful set of circumstances with universal poverty and nobody getting sick and people not dying for hundreds and hundreds of years and everybody having their own vine tree and their own, their, their own grapevine and their own 
fig tree, uh, universal prosperity, as I said, mankind will still be in rebellion, but that wrath is kindled but a little during that time period. That's what I believe it to be. And then it says, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. And so the blessed are all they is a fitting conclusion. And it promises blessing to all that put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That is what this is all about. It is, what is your choice and where will you spend eternity? No one will spend eternity in hell because of their sin. They will spend eternity in their hell because they refused God's payment for their sin. They refused God's payment for their sin. That is Jesus Christ. You either accept him as your savior and you avoid that or you willingly choose eternal death in hell. So the question today as you're listening to this is how about you? Where do you personally stand in light of Psalm 2? What choices have you made? Have you looked into God's word to show you that he is not kidding around, nor is he making a boast that he will not fulfill. He is deadly serious, and he's deadly serious about your future, your future in eternity. Where do you stand today? What is your choice? Will it be to receive God's wrath or God's blessing? That's the choice presented in Psalm 2. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the clarity with which your word speaks and sets forth two very distinct choices. Both choices are available to any human being at any time during their mortal life. But Lord, one day at a day and time not known to any one of us, we will breathe our last and we will be dead. And at that moment, whatever state we are in will be our permanent state. So we either accept the payment of your son, Jesus Christ, for our sin and are forever from that moment forward in the eternal state to be with God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit in eternity, or we don't make a choice and we get eternal damnation in hell, or we make a choice to reject God's payment and we choose eternal damnation in hell. Father, help those who have heard this message today clearly understand it. Help it prompt their hearts so that they make the right choice to have an eternity with you, to have a bright future, hope, and riches in heaven beyond their wildest imagination. This I pray, Father, that you would bring about in the heart of every single person that is hearing this, that they would either make the choice or be so confirmed in the choice that they have made, Lord that uh, they are changed forever and they can witness through this great Psalm 2 that you provided. We thank you in the precious and powerful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior, and God's people certainly said to this, amen and amen.